انسان کے دل میں بہت سے منصوبے ہیں لیکن خداون کا ارادہ ہی قائم رہے گا مسی یسو کے عظیم بابر کے جلالی نام میں آپ سب کو اسلام میں بابر مینول آج سو ویلکم کرتا ہوں پروگرام خدا کی آواز میں آج ہمارے ساتھ خدا کی خادم پاسٹر چیڈ جن کا تعلق ساؤتھ افریقہ سے ہے وہ ہمارے ساتھ اسٹوڈیو میں موجود ہیں اور میرا دل نہایت خوش ہے کہ خداوند اپنے جلال کے لیے نوجوانوں کو استعمال کر رہا ہے ان کی عمر 27 سیون ایئرز اولڈ ہے اور ستائیس سال کی عمر کے یہ نوجوان ہیں اپنے چرچ میں ایز اے یوتھ لیڈر ہے اور خدا ان کے مشن کو جو ان کا گریٹ کمیشن ہے اس کو پورا کرنے کے لیے وہ اراؤنڈ دا ورلڈ اسی طرح سے پاسٹر برینڈ کے ساتھ وہ جاتے ہیں اور جا کر خدا ان کے کلام کی منادی کرتے ہیں تو آج خدا ان کی زندہ آواز کو ہم پاسٹر چیٹ کے وسیلہ سے سنیں گے اور ضرور آپ کے دلوں کو یہ محسوس کرے گی اور آپ کی ایمان کی ترقی کا باعث بنے گی تو ابھی وقت ہے کہ ہم پاسٹر چیٹ سے خدا ان کی زندہ آواز کو سنیں ہیلو ایڈی سچ اے پروویج ٹو بی اور نیشنل نیوز ود یو گائز مائی نیم از چیٹ اینڈ آئی ایم فرام اے چرچ کولڈ آؤٹ لک ان رچرڈز بے ساؤتھ افریقہ اینڈ وٹ آئی ونٹ ڈو ٹو ڈے آئی جسٹ ونٹ شیئر ایم اے کوئک اسٹوری اے پروو ٹیسٹ منی اباؤٹ پروبلی فائیو اور سکس ایئرز اے گو آئی نوٹسٹ I was feeling quite angry, I was quite upset, and I felt like something was missing in my walk with God. Now, I've been in church probably since the age of 12. And I remember one day at a conference, they were singing songs and we were worshiping, and, and all of a sudden, I had this horrible thought in my heart, am I trying to worship a God that I don't know? And what happened was I came across the scripture. Now, we all know a hey, scripture is super encouraging. It's super helpful. It makes us feel good. Except this scripture felt like someone punched me in the stomach. I was so convicted. Now, this scripture is a letter that Jesus is writing to a church um, in the Bible. And basically, this church is known for doing great things. These people have worked hard. They've served God well. They seem to be really, really good Christians. But yet Jesus says this. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus says, I know all the things you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. And maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you've been serving in church. Maybe you're a good Christian. Maybe you're trying really hard. And Jesus says, I know you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they're apostles, but are not. You've discovered their lies. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you faced hard times or persecution, but you've pressed on. But then he says this, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. And the big idea this morning that I want to share is if we aren't in love with Jesus, Jesus is saying it's, it's the same as our backs are towards him. If we need to repent from something, it means clearly we're in the wrong direction. And Jesus is saying, hey, if, you, if you're not passionately in love with me, it's as if your back is towards me. And I want to share how I think this happened to me. Now, I'm in a great church with a great group of friends, but Have you ever walked in a really big crowd? If there's enough momentum, if there's enough, if the crowd is big enough, eventually you're going to be swept in their momentum. If, you, if you're sitting in a river flowing hard, eventually you're going to flow in the direction of that river. I think that's what happened to me. I'm surrounded by a bunch of Christians, singing Christian songs, saying Christian things, living in a Christian culture. And it's very easy to, well, join in those songs, join in the Christian culture, sound like a Christian. Well, not really knowing Jesus for myself. Another example, I'm here in Pakistan at the moment and I know someone who knows someone who, well, makes wonderful aloo paratha for breakfast. It's Amelia. And maybe, maybe someone might ask me, hey, do you know who can make, who can make me this meal? And I can say, yes, I do. When the truth is, I don't. I know someone who knows someone. I don't know them myself. I think that's what can happen in church. You can know the pastor who knows Jesus, or you can know your parents who know Jesus, but do you know Jesus yourself? And again, another scripture, hey, cut my heart. In Isaiah chapter 29, this is what the prophet says. And so the Lord says, these people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by habit. And I thought, hey, how much of my Christianness or my Christian walk with Jesus was me passionately knowing Jesus and how much was it just hey, the culture around me, just habits I learned how to sound 
like a Christian. And the point I want to make today is that, that Christianity is not about church. Our mission is not church. Our mission is Christ. And what I mean by that is, there's a scripture in Romans 6 that says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And often it's amazing when we get saved and we join a church and a great Christian community. But the point of being saved is not to be saved into a church and into a Christian culture. We're supposed to be saved into Christ. And well, I want to ask, how do you, how do you come back to a place of making Jesus the focus, making yourself in love with Jesus again? Well, in 1 John 4, it says, we love because he first loved us. And I remember years back, one of my friends, I, they hurt me badly and I struggled to forgive them. And I, I'm not a very forgiving person, but I noticed almost every day I'm asking God to forgive me until one day it clicked. Yo, if God forgives me this much, how on earth can I not forgive the next person? It's the same thing with Christ's love. Until we learn just how much Christ loved us, we're never going to learn to love him ourselves. And part of how much Jesus loved us, it says in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And I know you've heard that verse a thousand times. But the picture that comes to mind when I read this is picture, picture I want to buy a new pair of shoes. Let's say that new pair of shoes cost 10 rupees, but I got a thousand rupees in my back pocket. That shoes isn't that valuable to me if I buy it because, well, I still got so much spare money. But if I only have 10 rupees in my wallet and I take that last bit of money and I buy that shoes, clearly I value it so much if I'm willing to give everything just so I can have that pair of shoes. I know that's a silly example, but God did the same. God loves you so much. Jesus, God didn't have two or three sons as a backup in heaven. God sent his only son. God gave his only son to die because he valued you. He loves you and he wants you that much that he's willing to pay the full price for you. And part of that price, just to paint a picture of how much he loves you, and hopefully that turns to you loving him, is part of what God paid for was healing. So much of us accept sickness in our life, but, but healing is owed to you. Jesus has paid it. Imagine I go to the shop and I pay for something and I don't get it. It's wrong. I need to fight for it. Isaiah says, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, beaten so we could be made whole. God paid for you to have provision. The Bible says, look at the birds of the sky. Hey, they don't store up things in barns or try to store up food, but yet God provides for them. God loves you. He's paid for your provision. When I came to Pakistan, I had to pay for a visa, to pay for a passport, just so I can prove where I belong to, that I have permission to enter this country. God paid for you to have a new passport, a new identity by adopting you into his family, giving you sonship. God paid for you to have that passport, that access into eternity one day. God paid for your forgiveness. In Ephesians, it says he's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave us our sins. God loves you this much. And the Bible says um, in John chapter 6, verse 29, this is the only work God wants from you, to believe in the one he has sent. Now, I know you don't know me, but I'm not married. But I can imagine one day that you know, I'd really like a wife who can cook good food, who can sing well because I'm a musician. What a, what, a, what a nice wife to have. But at the same time, I can imagine one day when my wife walks down the aisle, I'm probably not going to care so much about her ability to cook or if she can sing or join my worship team. What I'm going to care about is I just want to know my bride loves me more than anyone else. And the, God says, hey, Christ is coming back for his bride, the church. And when, when, when Jesus is standing there waiting for his bride, I don't think he cares so much how well we can serve and how well we can cook and how well we can sing songs in church. I think he wants a bride that just loves him. 
That is, that is our mission. That is the point of, of why we try and go to church. It's so we can know Him more, so we can love Him more. Amen. Will you close your eyes? I just want to pray. Father, we want to repent, Lord, where we've made anything in church or in life more important than you. Will you remind us, Father, that the point of our Christianity is not just church and good works. The point of our Christianity is to know you, to love you, and to love others. Will you remind us of this? May we get to know you intimately and personally again, I pray. Amen.